Hey, everyone. This is Heidi St. John. Welcome to the Heidi St. John podcast. You guys know that I am a huge advocate for the pro-life movement and have been for many, many decades. And I've been following a young woman by the name of Angela Stanton King. I first found her on Instagram, and I was just captivated by her voice in the black community for the unborn. And uh, over the last year, some kind of extraordinary things happened. She started working with the RF with RFK's campaign as he was running for as an independent for the White House. And there was some controversy. And so I reached out to her on Instagram and started asking her some questions. And we have developed a friendship. And uh, just a few weeks ago, when I was in Georgia, sort of stranded there because of Hurricane Helene, she picked me up from the airport and we got to spend a little more time together. I've invited her on the show today because she has an extraordinary story. It is a story of resilience. It's a story of forgiveness. It's a story of miracles. And we know that God is still doing miracles. You're going to love this woman as much as I do. Stick around. I think you're going to be encouraged. Well, before we jump in today, I want to let you guys know about some things that are happening on my calendar. I'm just about to wrap up my speaking season, but I got a couple things coming up. I'm going to be at the E Women Conference, Extraordinary Women Conference in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, with my friend Lisa Bevere and several other wonderful keynote speakers. You guys are not going to want to miss it. You can find out more information by going to HeidiStJohn.com forward slash events. This is going to be a fantastic conference. Uh, last I heard, there's almost 2,000 women slated to attend this event. Uh, it's going to be great. So come and join me there. That's October 25th and 26th. And then in November, I'm going to be helping to end See the National Bible Bee. I love the Bible Bee. I'm honored to be asked to be part of that panel, and I'm going to be working with my friends David and Jason Benham. We're going to have a hoot and holler and good time and saw, uh, watch some extraordinary kids reciting the Bible. So I can't wait to do that. That's the National Bible Bee. Uh, but again, you guys, I would love to come and speak for your event in 2025, and you can find out more about how to invite me by going to HeidiStJohn.com and just clicking on the speaker tab. All right, I'm going to jump right into this interview. This is a hard-hitting interview. Angela doesn't pull any punches, and we're going to be talking about some pretty serious issues. If you've got little ones, this might not be the episode that you want to listen to with them, or at least listen to it first and come back later if you feel like it's appropriate. But uh, I'm excited to share this interview with you. I love this woman, and I can't wait for you guys to meet her and follow her and get her book. And so uh, here's my interview with my friend, Angela Stanton King. All right. So Angie, my friend, welcome to the podcast. I'm so excited that you're here. I'm so glad to be here, Heidi. I remember when you and I kind of had our first exchange <laughs> on <laughs> IG. <laughs> People were kind of upset with me, but God is amazing. I'll just say that. <laughs> well, you okay. So since you, you brought it up, I was going to bring it up too, but since you brought it up first, let's tell everybody kind of our first exchange and okay. how we became friends. Right. Um, you can shoot first. <laughs> well, uh, so I, I will say, OK, I'll start. I have been a super fan of your work, been following you on Instagram for quite a while and just watching your heart for uh, the unborn and to help uh, moms who find themselves with difficult pregnancies, maybe unplanned pregnancies. And so I followed your work for a really long time. And then you uh, came out in support of Robert Kennedy. And I think before then. So I don't, I'm not sure if I'd message you before or not. I feel like I did. And uh, then you came out in support of Robert Kennedy, who I actually really uh, admire on many, many issues, except for abortion. <laughs> and yeah. so I was like, hold up, hold up. How are you, this powerful voice for the unborn, helping RFK in his run for the White House? And this, of course, before he joined the Trump train and all the things. So that's how I remember it. How do you remember it? That's exactly how I remember it, the same way. And um <laughs> One of the things that I remember about you is that you weren't attacking me, you were asking me. Because a lot of people came out and they were attacking me because they couldn't understand my position and they couldn't see what God was doing. And you were just asking me because you couldn't understand it in that moment. And I couldn't even say that I understood it in that <laughs> moment. I just know that that God said, go. And um, it was kind of almost similar to my relationship with Trump when I first went in to speak to him about criminal justice reform and how many people in my community didn't want me to go in or didn't want me to work with him because they felt yep. as though, you know, he was a racist. 
but I had to take emotions out of it mm-hmm. and go where my favor was in order to do the work that God had sent me to do. So, whew, that was a journey, but Girl. I wrote a book about it. <laughs> well, and honestly, um, I was really happy to hear back from you because I, I was watching the comments on Instagram and, and uh, you took a bit of a shellacking. I mean, there's no, there's no question, but I loved your heart. And that's why I reached out to you because I was like, listen, I know this woman's heart. I can see her heart and there's got to be a reason. And so let's take everybody back because I had invited you to come on the show. That was a long time ago. And I feel like we've lived 15 lifetimes (laughs) since then. Yes, it feels like it. (laughs) Yeah, it really does. And I was so uh, happy a few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to connect with you briefly when I got stranded in Atlanta on my way to Asheville. And you were kind enough to pick me up from my hotel in the morning and, and, and take me to the airport. It's the first time I got to meet you in person, and you just radiate the love of Jesus. So, uh, right. so excited for you and to see what God's doing with your life. Let's take everybody, because you have an amazing story. Uh, it's, it's almost, it's one of those stories that y- even when you were telling me sort of the, the brief version of your life story, I was like, what? What, the what, the what, the what? Like, you have an amazing story. So take us back to, let's just go back to the beginning, Angela, because I love your story is a story of redemption, and it's a story of God at work and 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 creating a way where there seemed to be no way. This is what the Lord does. So uh, talk to us about kind of your growing up, where you came from, because this story, I hope everybody, like, sits down. Okay, everybody, get real quiet and listen, because you're going to love this story. Man, Hit us. A- Tell us where you came from. It, it, it's such an awesome story that as I sit back and I look at it, I realize that it's only one that God could write. So, you know, mm. there have been times in my lifetime when I've questioned things, right? And, and you don't have to question anything. All you have to do is trust God. And so this book that you see in the background, King Trump Kennedy, this is actually the story that's going to tell it all. I think this is kind of my best work yet, but um, and to, and a lot of people know my story. Like I, I was born into some poverty and dysfunction, you know, labeled to be a statistic like many mm. people from my community ended up, you know, going to prison, went to prison. Okay, wait, stop, 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 stop. One does not simply say I went to prison. <laughs> right. Yeah. How, yeah. what happened? I mean, what, why yeah, did you end up well, in prison? Oh gosh. You don't even need to give us the whole story, but just the, I was, I was, give us so the. Anybody, so, so my life has been so amazing that I've had to write several different books about it. So Lies <laughs> of a Real Housewife is the first breaking story about how I ended up in prison, you know, in a, in, in a fraud scheme with, with Phaedra Parks from Housewives of Atlanta and her husband, Apollo, and getting out of prison, realizing that they framed me writing my life story to because I had nothing else left but my story. I mean, I was yeah. I was a mother that had gone to prison on, on this nonviolent charge, giving birth to my daughter, chained to a bed. Everybody was trying to encourage me to abort her. Being released from prison with a $25 check and a bus ticket after losing my mother and my grandmother both to massive heart attacks while I was in prison as well. So basically mm-hmm. losing everything except my children and coming home to absolutely nothing and trying to rebuild my life from there. And this was a time when they didn't have, you know, ban the box and they didn't have, you know, where you could get welfare or section eight if you were a convicted felon. So imagine being a convicted felon for a nonviolent charge and also being a mother that's trying to survive. So I ended up writing my life story about how I ended up going to prison and just really freeing myself from a lot of childhood trauma and this was at a time that that God told me he wanted me to write my story right and I knew that my story was a hot seat because boy had I been through some things if if, listen you don't get to you were spilling some tea listen I spilled some tea but you don't get to King Trump and Kennedy by just being anybody so you can imagine (laughs) the life that I have lived to get to where I'm at now but um I told the story and when I told the story some people we're not too happy. And um, I say, God, you told me to trust you. Here I am. I don't even have 30 cents. And I'm being sued by Phaedra Parks, BJ Bernstein, and L. Linwood for $30 million. And I don't even have 30 cents. And, and God says, trust me. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, I got to be crazy. But you say trust you, so I'm going to do this. I want to step out on faith. And to make a long story short, 
I ended up getting an attorney to represent this case pro bono for four years and walking away victoriously, not only with my story, but with my own publishing company. And that's, you know, in the midst of me getting out of jail and, and while this court case is taking place, me rebuilding myself and ending up on the last day that I had in a shelter because you only get 45 days and then you have to max out and go somewhere else. And I remember on the last day that I had and I had nowhere to go and I was truly in a dark place at this time because I really just felt like, you know, giving up because everywhere that I went, it was just a door closed in my face and I wasn't just living for me. I was living for my children because although I had made some mistakes, I still love my children and I still yeah. want it. And well, how many children did you have? So you're in. So you, you're at the end of 45 days in a shelter. Tell us about how, how many children I you have. have. What year children. was this? This is in 2005. I have four children with me. Um, my oldest daughter is is safe away. She's in New York. She's being raised with my father. So my other four children are with me. So I leave the shelter. Somebody gives me a token. I catch a bus all the way to Forest Park, Georgia to go to this center for women and children looking for help. And I get off the bus and I've got like two bags of garbage clothes. I've got a stroller. I got one baby in the stroller. I've got the other one standing on the back of the stroller. I got one walking. I've got one on my hip. And I remember walking into this place and I remember telling this lady who's sitting behind the desk and I said, look, <laughs> I said, if you don't help me today, I said, I am going to die. Mm. I said, and not only am I going to die, but I am going to take my children with me. And this is how lost I was in this moment because I was in a truly dark place. I come home from prison. I've been framed. I couldn't get any help. I couldn't get any assistance. I'm trying to tell my story. They're suing me. They're, they're silencing me with my story. My story is all that I've got. I don't have anywhere to go. I've lost my mother and my grandmother when I was incarcerated. All of this stuff happened simultaneously. Like my daughter was born six months after my daughter, my mother passed six months after my mother, my grandmother passed. And six months after that, I was released from prison with a $25 check and a bus ticket. So anyway, I walk here and this lady sitting behind his desk. <laughs> and it just happens to be that the lady sitting behind the desk that day is LV the King, the niece of Martin. Mm, come Angel. on. Come on. So, <laughs> she says, why would you say such a thing? Right? She says, no, you're not. And she gave me a job that day. And not only did she give me a job that day, but she helped me and my children get our own place. And not only did she do that, but she became a pillar in my life. She began to take on that, that motherly role that I had lost to bring back the restoration that me and my children needed in mm. order to heal and in order to get to the next step. So not only is she helping me, not only is she employing me, not only is she mentoring me, but she is loving me and my children in this moment. Wow. And from that, I got to work with her and her entire family for like the next 15 years on several community restoration projects, you know, and that's what the King part of the book is about. So she's wow. like an adopted mom to you she's at this my point. Mom. She's yeah, my god so mom. And then she, God says to me, and it's amazing that you said something about Joseph when you prayed, because that's yeah. referenced throughout the book. He already showed me that because I actually did go to prison and find favor mm -hmm. with the king. And God says, not only am I going to connect you with the family, he says, but I'm going to give you the name. And so I actually got married and my husband, last name is King. So that's where the angel <laughs> saying King comes from. So God is just so amazing. But I to, to, to go on from there, because I know we don't have much time, but my relationship with Alveda, of course, President Trump runs. And one of his initiatives is criminal justice reform. And so she says to me, I want you to talk to Trump. I want you to go in. I want you to tell your story. And now, once again, I'm hearing God say, trust me, because I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> According to them, this man is a racist and he hates black people. So I'm putting myself in, a, in another situation where I, I'm humbling myself and I'm trusting God. Right. And I go in and I meet this man and this man is nothing like people told That's me. Right. He was. That's right. And not only, you know, did he listen to my story, but he passed the First Step Act. He made it illegal for them to chain women to the bed during childbirth because of my story. He gave me a full and unconditional pardon 
From there, I went on to advocate from other people, run for office, help other people get pardoned. And then COVID hit. <laughs> and when COVID hit, I meet RFK. <laughs> so my relationship with Trump leads me to my relationship <laughs> with Robert F. Kennedy. And I meet Robert F. Kennedy through my relationship with someone that I absolutely adore, Dr. Simone Gold, because we are now going all over the country fighting against vaccine mandates. Dr. Simone Gold was gracious enough to fund our organization, American King Foundation, because we were fighting so much censorship to take them into our communities and directly deliver the messages that needed to be brought. And that ended up with me being on a stage with RFK at the Lincoln Memorial, with one of the biggest defeat the mandate marches where we were standing in front of 40,000 people. And amazing. next thing it's you know, he says he's running for president. Now at first he ran as a Democrat. Now I wasn't gonna touch that with a, with a 50 foot pole, <laughs> I tell you, cause they need Jesus, okay? Yeah, and it's the platform, and that's what we keep telling people. You stop looking at the personalities and the people and all the things. This is the platform. If you read the platform of the Democrat Party, anybody who claims to be a follower of Jesus Christ cannot be a Democrat. Full stop. I mean, full stop, because the platform is a not the in policies. line. It's the yeah. policies, and, and yeah. it's, just, it's not of God. It's not. It's not of life, you know, it's, it's, it's everything. It's, 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 we're living in some very dark times right now. And I think people that are spiritual can see it. And I think that God is just aligning all his warriors and we come in, in different come colors. You know, we come in from different religions. We come from different parties. And when RFK announced that he was running as an independent, at first when he announced he was running as a Democrat, I said, if I ever had to support a Democrat, it would be him. And then he announced that he was coming as an independent. And because I knew RFK's heart and I knew this man who was so selfless and always so humble and always willing to listen to our communities. Cause it's a lot of times people come to our communities and they do a lot of talking, but they don't take the time to listen to us. And then they don't take what we say and implement it into their policies when they're addressing our issues. Mm -hmm. So that was something that I respected about him. And that is how this story goes. King. It's, it's kind of an amazing, um, I want to go back to something because uh, there's so many aspects of your story that I find redeeming because I want to talk about um, Aunt Angie and Angie's yeah. house. Yeah. But that, but we can't talk about that without talking about your daughter. So you yeah. said that you, you gave birth to a baby, literally chained to a bed. I can't even imagine yeah. being chained to a bed while you're trying to have a baby. Un, it sounds so barbaric, right? Just unbelievable. Well, I mean, but, they wouldn't do a dog like that. No, they would not. And they wanted, I mean, they wanted you to get an abortion, right? I mean, this was, this was the pressure that you were under in the penal system here in the United States is just, well, you know, when, get an abortion. When you're when you're a prisoner or you're a ward of the state, you know, the cost of, of the birth, it, it lies on them. So it's cheaper for them to send me out, you know, to get an abortion than versus them having to actually pay for an entire birth or fund me while I'm pregnant or make sure that they provide medical care. And I mean, everything around the situation was completely dark, but the fact that that same daughter ended up winning the Harvard International Debate Championship and is now in her third year at MIT on a full Come on. So it's almost like God had a plan for her life and somebody was trying to take her out before she ever had a chance to take a breath outside your womb. And that is why we value life, regardless yes. of its circumstances. Yeah. And that is why we have... So life. you are then you would say to the pro-choicer whose argument is, well, what about a baby who's conceived in rape? Mm -hmm. What would you say? Well, you know, it's a crazy story to that because my father was actually conceived in rape. And this is a story mm -hmm. that I didn't learn until I was an adult. And what people don't understand is that rape babies or abortion, it, it wipes out entire bloodlines and entire generations yeah. because you know, had my grandmother not chosen life, you know, my dad wouldn't have been born, I wouldn't have been born, my children wouldn't have been born. And I think about the reality of a lot of situations. I think about the fact that, you know, they advocate 
to abort the rape baby, but they don't advocate to abort the rapist. Okay, mm -hmm. like if, if you're gonna kill the baby, kill the rapist. Okay, mm -hmm. like the, we're we're snuffing out innocent life, and I I just think that there is value in life. I know people that were conceived in rape. Besides my father, I, ha I have a cousin. I have a good friend of mine. She's a huge influencer. Her name is Shamika Michelle. She has an awesome story. She was also conceived in rape. To say, do that you know Ryan uh, Bomberger? I've heard of him before. You you guys have to meet him. He also was uh, conceived in rape. He has an incredible story that he and his wife have gone on to found the Radiance Foundation. And yeah. these people who the enemy wanted to uh, kill before yeah. they were born based on the circumstances of their birth are actually doing incredible things for the Lord and for the communities in which they live. And I wonder, uh, Angie, what would happen if we flipped the narrative on its head here in the country and we said, listen, abortion actually hurts women. It doesn't erase the rape. It doesn't erase the, the sin and the atrocity. So no one's making excuses for a rapist. But we're saying uh, murdering the unborn baby, the innocent party, is not a solution to human suffering. It is not. And I just, I just believe that there is value in life. And that is the message because... A lot of women that have been raped have loved their babies more than they mm. have hated their rapists because what women, you know, have to understand is that the baby is still yours too, mm -hmm. right? It, it's still yours. So in some of these situations, it takes more love than hate. It yeah. takes a whole lot of prayer. But my message is always that there's value in life regardless yeah. of circumstances. And I mm -hmm. think that the people that, that I know that were born in the most adversity become some of the greatest people to ever walk this earth. Mm -hmm. It's true. The enemy wanted to, he wanted to, he wanted to snuff them out before mm -hmm. they like me. Look mm -hmm. at how God is using me. And I don't think that I'm the best person to ever do this work, but I've been able, but from following God and answering my calling to save over 80 babies that wouldn't be here. The, mm -hmm. the, now, those are generations because those babies are going to grow up to have babies. That's exactly right. Their babies are going to grow up to have babies. So these are entire bloodlines and generations. So I just don't preach the, mes the message of abortion or death because I just believe that God is life and that God mm -hmm. is love. What would you say, uh, Angie, to the the lie that honestly the black community has bought more than I think almost any other community because Planned Parenthood targeted the black community. Margaret Sanger was a eugenicist. Uh, she believed that the black should be wiped off the face of the earth. And so her solution to that was to put abortion clinics clinics, I hate that word, you know, abortion mills uh, in the poorest of black communities. It's an atrocity. It's a genocide that has been perpetrated against the black community now for generations. And it breaks my heart to have seen so many people pushing this in the community that needed that needed freedom more than any other community. And I wonder if you have seen uh change happen? Are you starting to see the narrative, the, the lie of abortion say, in the black community begin to be addressed? It's definitely beginning to be addressed because you have people like me that are speaking out against it. Um, and I think that it's time for us to address this issue within my generation. Um, yeah. God bless my godmother, Alveda King, Catherine yeah. Davis, Star Parker, Day Garner, you know, uh, Reverend Dean, all of those, Dean Nelson, he's passed on now, but all of those that kind of have, have, have done this work before me and, and brought mm -hmm. me in the circle. It's like, we have to have a warrior for every yes. generation, every yes. generation. And how many have we aborted, right? Mm -hmm. And so you have to have voices like mine that are not afraid to go into the wilderness, bring these people out, scream out from the top of the mountains and say, hey, this is wrong. And also put somebody before them that's relatable, right? Mm -hmm. Because in the pro-life work, and I've done it, and, and I love you guys, right? I've been at the March for Life. And every time I go there, I don't go one time without crying. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you why I cry and why I'm so angry when I go. I almost had to stop going. It hurts me so bad to see that on one side, the majority of the people fighting for our babies to be aborted. And then on this side, there are only about three of us that are black, right? We're, we're three little mm -hmm. specks of pepper 
standing in an entire sea of white fighting for life. And I'm always asked, where is your community? Don't they care? Don't they care about their babies? Don't they care about their future? And when I look across the street, the same people that are telling me that Black Lives Matter are advocating to lynch Black life in the womb. Not only are they advocating to lynch Black life in the womb, they're advocating to lynch the very Black life that they create. But you're ready to burn down an entire entire country, making every other community, white people are racist, we hate them. You want white people to value black life, but we're advocating, we're, we're, we're concerned about racism, but running to the polls on November, on November 5th to vote to abort our own race. It's painful and it is a hard fight. And, and what I've learned in this space is that sometimes it's also a lonely road Because in my community, pro-choice is so widely accepted. It's almost as if you're pro-life, that you're against women's rights. And I've never understood that because I've always known you have to be born in order to become a woman. Come on. I don't even like, I don't even know what the hell, excuse me. I don't know if I can say that word, but I don't even know what the heck they got going on, right? You're advocating to execute the women of tomorrow in the name of women's rights. Right. You're advocating for reproductive rights that you already have. Nobody has to give you the right to reproduce. I know I, I got pregnant five times. Nobody. What you're fighting for is a right to kill your reproduction. Mm. Right. It's, it, it's a reproductive right to kill. And so on one side, pro-choice is so widely accepted in my community. And there, there's a certain mindset because we have to think. How has it been advertised? How has it been promoted to our community? I'm, I'm in for a hard battle. No, they're not gonna listen to somebody outside of their community telling them to value life. They have to have somebody that they relate to that can help them understand this because this is something that has been legal since I, before I was born. Yep, yep. And there was a time that they didn't believe anything was wrong with slavery because it was legal. And you have Kamala, Harris on a HBCU reproductive rights tour with the abortion Hot Wheels bus in tow, telling them that it's freedom yeah. and liberation to execute their own children. And they're crying about being an oppressed minority, but they're aborting their votes. So I'm in a, I'm, I'm in a, it, it's a tough situation because I have one side that, that believes, you know, that all life matters. And I believe that all life matters too. And they don't understand that I'm specifically targeting the black community for life because their left is specifically targeting them for abortion, right? It's not a, it's not a race thing with me. It's a need thing with me because I know that over 40% of our population has been aborted. I know that 20 million black lives has been aborted since the beginning of Roe v. Wade. I know that we have abortion clinics in our communities all across America, and there isn't one single abortion clinic at the border. Yeah. Yeah, I have good sense. Yeah. (laughs) Right? And I know that every time something comes out of a black woman's mouth that is supposedly a lead member in Congress on the Democrat side, it is about us having a right to execute our own children and that's something that I cannot respect in a day and area with the in a day and era where they are saying black lives matter mm. and they want to burn down the entire country that's right while aborting their own children and lynching them in the womb I just I can't stand with that well and I mean I'm just I listen to you and this has happened to me every time I'm uh, around you it just moves me to tears uh it's it's horrific it's uh, it's absolutely horrific. And I had, I was interviewing a gentleman the other day who's uh, running for governor here in Washington State. And the uh, 
the the pro choice lobby is uh, it's demonic, right? And so the the talking points that come out of the the pro choice lobby, they want to soften the language, right? It becomes about women's rights, and I love that you so rightly frame it. You're not asking for reproductive rights; you're asking for the right to extinguish, to exterminate your own children. It's barbaric. And I I said to uh, this guy who would be the governor of Washington State, well, if we're going to have if we want to codify abortion into the state law here in Washington, then I say we also make it mandatory that people watch an abortion. Watch what this actually is. This is a barbaric, inhumane, demonic, evil thing that we are doing to the most vulnerable among us. And God forgive us because our nation is under judgment because of this. And I, I, I have been, you know, for a long, long time, I don't think, I mean, Angela, we haven't had a whole lot of time to talk, but they wanted me to abort my own daughter when she was uh, in the womb because they said she had a heart anomaly and her thigh measurements were off and God forbid she would have Down syndrome. And so at 17 weeks uh, at Emanuel Hospital in the middle of downtown Portland, they invited me to take the life of my own child. And as I consider what is happening in the world right now, I mean, we obviously, we made a choice that day. And I just said, no, did you not see her on an ultrasound? I saw a baby suck at its thumb. I saw 10, 10 fingers and 10 toes and I watched a little heartbeat. Uh, no, I'm not taking the life of, of this little one. It's not my life to take. The Lord said, I give and I take away. And when we do that, boy, we commit, we commit murder. And that is the truth. And I love that you are so boldly speaking out because you're right. Uh, you know, with, in the pro-life movement, as with so many other issues, we're never going to reach the communities we want until we have people who actually represent those communities who are bold enough to stand up and say, no, no more. We can't continue with this. And speaking out against Black Lives Matter, it's the same thing. Right. Black Lives Matter doesn't care about black people. They don't care about the black unborn. They don't care about black conservatives. They don't care about uh, black police officers. They don't care about it. it. They're a Marxist political organization that is hell bent on extinguishing many of the people who would potentially vote for them in the future. It's astonishing. You took your voice and your platform and you created Angie's house. And this is part of the this was sort of how I found you. Tell us a little bit about that, because I want my listeners to get on board and support what you're doing. So you remember I said I used to it would hurt me when I would go to the March for Life. Like it was a really and it brings tears to my eyes now because. Yeah. It just really hurt me that. I felt like I was standing alone. And we were wiping out an entire generation. And I just couldn't understand how. Black women were so misled. Mm -hmm. And how we had gone from an era of of civil rights where we were, you know, fighting to be free, to fighting to, you know, execute our own children. And it just hurts because we're nothing without our children. Like, life has to go on. We may not live another 40, 50 years. We're going to eventually wipe out, right? And our children are the future. So how many are we aborting? Right. But anyway, so I I used to get tired of of going to the marches because I had been on the argument side of pro-life for so long. And I said, you know what? Roe v. Wade was overturned. We were all excited. And I said, now it's time to provide a solution. I've been arguing long enough. I was and I wasn't the type for protest because you guys would have to come bomb me out of jail every time. I swing, right? So I, I'm the Peter out of the pool. I'm, I'm gonna cut the ear off. Y'all go on and, and get She's me out. She's Peter of jail. out there with the sword. Yeah. yeah. Ear back on, get me out of jail. I'm Peter. So it's I can't be in that energy. <laughs> so I say it's time to be on the on the solution side. Like we've won that part of the fight. Now what do we do? And so I kept hearing this word choice 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 and then i i heard the spirit say choosing to keep the baby is also a choice mm. right mm-hmm. and i said okay because i'm i live in a heavy democrat family and it's not just about me arguing on these platforms like i really it's a real conversation with people that are really really claiming to be pro-choice but even if you're pro-choice that doesn't mean that you can't support pro-life mm-hmm Right? That doesn't mean that you can't support pro-life. And so he says choice. And so I started doing my research about where all of these abortion clinics were placed. And I realized that yes, 80% of them were in our communities. And I said, okay, if Planned Parenthood is the only place that they have to go, 
are they really given a choice? Because in a lot of these communities, Planned Parenthood is the only place to go. And it's the I, only choice. It's the only choice. And then I thought about it and I'm like, you know, when I'm hungry, I want to go grab a bite to eat during my lunch break. It's usually a McDonald's or a Burger King. It's usually a Popeye's or a KFC. I said, but here is Planned Parenthood. And it just had this vision that we would have an Auntie Angie's house everywhere that there was a Planned Parenthood in a black community so that women would actually have the option to choose life, right? Yeah. That they don't just have to go to the abortion clinic and feel like an abortion is the only way to go because this message that we need to abort our children because of poverty is just not true. Mm -hmm. And no woman should be having an abortion because she feels that she doesn't have support. Yeah. And so I started my first Auntie Angie's house. I went through a lot. They burned down our location. We were in the King District. We had a nine bedroom, nine bath. We were Wait, when you say, hold on, hold on. You go, you, you skip over these things. <laughs> when you say they burned down our location, for example. Yeah. What do you mean? We don't know who did it, but we got in a location and um, we, were re we were renovating the location and I went to meet the contractor and the entire building was gone. And um, we happened to catch the news clip and it, the neighbors heard a loud explosion and then the next thing we know it was engulfed. The funny thing though was that this 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 home was directly across from Senator Warnock's church. Uh-oh. Yeah. So I said, okay. That I, man, I, I'm I said, serious. Listen, I, hey, mm. I'm not, Heidi, we're not saying he did it. We don't want anybody. No, I'm here. not saying he did it. I'm just saying there's a special place in hell for that man who well, says that he, who says that he represents the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and advocates for the extinguishing of human life in the womb. That's all. It's everything that he represents is anti-life. It's an anti-God yep. agenda. Yep. Yeah. So take the reverend off your name, Warnock. I mean, I'm sorry. It just. It just seems to me that his name sounds a lot like Warlock, but I'm just, I mean, that's, well, that's just me. That's what I actually refer to him as. I right? mean. Warlock, but you yeah. know. Anyway. Anyway. Um, I said, I, I said, <laughs> God, I said, okay. That's another one. He says, trust me. He says, the building is burned down, but the vision is not burned out. I want to say mm -hmm. two months later, we started with us a single bedroom home. I mean, a single family home. It was a two bedroom, one bath. It wasn't much. But it was a start to help some women that would need somewhere to go in that community. And then from there, RFK stops by and all freaking hell breaks <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and so this is where, so you, and you don't expect this, do you? I mean, it wasn't like you were. No, because right. other, other people from other political parties had been by Auntie Angie's house. I was political, but the organization was not. The organization is a 501c3. Anyone that wants to come by and support mothers and children, they can. But when RFK <laughs> stepped foot in Auntie Angie's house, game all changer. Hell all hell broke loose. All, mm -hmm. all hell broke loose. All hell broke loose. And I'm like, God, what is going on? <sighs> now, why why did he stop by? Why why did he, why was he interested? Um, I had actually called him and asked him to come by. I had actually, um, I put in a call to Trump too. I didn't have Trump's direct number, so I couldn't call him directly. But I did have RFK's direct number. Um, I put a call in to one of Trump's advisors and um, asked her if Trump could come by. And she told me that um, I couldn't expect him to sit on the sofa. And I didn't hold it against Trump. But um, I did feel some type of way because I felt like you know, we had created, you know, relationships and bonds and we were all a team and we were all working together. And in my mind, I had really set this whole thing up with, with Trump in mind. I had envisioned, sure. you know, Trump coming to Auntie Angie's house. He had pardoned me. He had given me this awesome platform, this awesome renewal on life. And I was tired of people calling Trump a racist. You know, if you watch my Breakfast Club interview and I've stood 10 toes down for Trump and I'm like, what is a better way for him to show these people that he is not racist and to be sitting here in the hood, right? Mm -hmm. Holding one of our babies, promoting mm -hmm. maternal health and, and, and talking about saving black And what's people. funny about that is even even if he does that, they're still going to scream that he's a racist. They're, they're going to say gonna they're going to say it was a photo op. He didn't really mean it. 
Uh, I mean, like you, when I met with him, you know, the first time I spent about an hour with him and spoke with him, he loves the country. He's a good man. Uh, he's a good man. He's bombastic, but he's a good man. <laughs> Very, you know, he, and he's he's aggressive and he's assertive, but that's okay. That's how God. That's created. what, and that's how God created him. And frankly, that's what we need right now. And I'm the same way. And, and yeah. so, and sometimes, you know, people don't get it because I'm I'm very straightforward. I'm very aggressive. I don't like to play. And so, you know, I said okay. I just I just kept going when I found out that you know Trump couldn't come by or whatever. And I called RFK and RFK said, yeah, I'll come by. And to me. My door is always open to someone pro-choice because I know that when you leave there, you're going to feel a different way. You That's can't right. come in Auntie Angie's house and hear these stories and see the work that we do and not find, hold on one second, <clears throat> excuse me, and not find an appreciation for the work that we do. So we opened our doors, RFK came by, we sat for an entire hour. He listened, he held our babies, he went live, it goes viral. Next thing you know, text messages are blowing up, phone is blowing up, I'm being called a traitor, I'm being told I better remember where I came from. Holy I'm being moly. Told that I would be nothing without Trump, he gave me a part and I should still be somewhere in prison. And, um, I just came up under a, a slew of attacks and I couldn't understand it. And I hadn't even signed on to work with RFK at this time or anything. This was just because this man came by and gave us a visit and lended some much needed support because we had been asking for support, you know, and everyone was welcome, you know, to support us. And I think that some people were uh, maybe upset because I had, requested you know some support and maybe they didn't tell anybody about my request and then this happened and then they're like oh shit and then trying to make me out to be the bad guy so well, and i wonder too i mean i i think this is the same reason why i think that in primaries or whenever when we're talking about political things i want to hear what the democrat has to say you want to come over and talk to me? I want to hear your ideas. We there we've squashed the free exchange of ideas in the country. It's not that I don't think that their their platform is terrible and they're I ve vehemently disagree with almost every position of the Democrat Party, but I will defend to the death your right to say what you want to say and I think when we have that that's why you have a pro choicer that comes into your orbit, invite them in. For goodness sake, I mean it gives you the opportunity to move the needle. And I, and I also realized, like me, I'm I'm one of your, I'm one, like if anybody on your team was a firecracker, it would be me. Like I would definitely be the one that you would send into a room full of pro-choicers, right? Yeah, because yeah. my thing is, and I love, you know, our, our, our pro-life fight, but on this side, everybody agrees with me already, right? Right, you're trying like, to get out of the echo chamber. Table. Yeah, I've that, like I don't have you guys sit at the table Figure all that out. Call me. Tell me what I need to do. I'm out here in the wilderness. I'm catching the people that is not coming to the table with us. And I'm bringing them over here. And I'm saying, hey, look at it from this perspective. Come on. Am I going to be 100% successful in getting everybody to be, you know, against, you know, pro-choice? Maybe not. Right. Because I gave up that fight a long time ago because I was getting beat down so bad. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't have more power than God. All I'm here to do is radiate this light. Let yes. women know that Come on. there is another option. And then when I did work with RFK, God used me to help them. I'm at it to everybody. I'm getting beat up. <laughs> By, mm -hmm. by us, right? And then I'm getting whooped over here too because it wasn't an yeah. easy fight because I'm the only pro-lifer at the table. Nobody that's in his ear is in agreement with what I'm saying. You know how it is when these people have their mind made up, right? Yeah, yeah, but yeah. God, God bless me to, to be a voice of reason and help them look at it from another perspective. And honestly, now, I think this is an important point because this is why I didn't attack you. Uh, when I saw what was happening on Instagram, I just thought, all right, uh, I don't know. I mean, I was really disappointed. I know you were, too, in some of the statements that RFK made about abortion. Oh, my God. Uh, 
And it, it made it just made me kind of sick to my stomach. But I also realized his wife is absolutely, you know, hardcore pro choicer. And I thought, here's Angela, and she's got this. Sh- you have his ear. Yes. I mean, you can influence him. And I think we want that. I would think that the pro life movement would want that because, and this is what I believed about you, and obviously I still do that even though you were helping RFK or you were kind of a surrogate for him and he wasn't my choice largely because of his uh, stance on abortion, but he needs those people who can talk to him and reason with him and pray for him and know him and be in relationship with him who can advocate for the unborn. And without that voice, he got nobody around him doing that. You're it. You've got nobody around him doing that. And it is not just him. He's put me in a position where I'm a voice to everyone who supports him. Yes, Everyone who on. follows him, everybody who is a member of Team Kennedy, we formed the Unity Party. So we didn't just come along. We brought all of these people with us. And I've been able to change the mindset of come an on. entire party. And we've created and implemented policies about more choices, more life. You don't know. I When I heard RFK say Every abortion is a tragedy. I don't want any woman to abort because of poverty. Mm-hmm. I knew that I was making treadway. When mm-hmm. when that statement came out, when that video came out, and I remember it very well, and I talk about it in this book because it was the day before Mother's Day. And it was a very, it was the weekend of Mother's Day. It was a very emotional time for me because I had lost my mother in prison and my daughter was taken away from me. And I happened to be spending the weekend with Nicole Shanahan taking her on a black engagement tour in in Houston, Texas. And her daughter wasn't with her. You know, she her daughter was with her father. So it was emotional for her. Yes. So we're all emotional in this moment, but we're all having this 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 overwhelming feeling about the importance of the bond between mother and child. Come on. And then they dropped this video. And yeah. I didn't know he did the interview. And I didn't know they were dropping the interview. And my heart was shattered into pieces because I'm like, you know, who advised this? Because it's a it's it's Mother's Day weekend, guys. I know it was the the, yeah. I mean, read the room. (laughs) Oh my god, I was so just bad timing. But I talked to Bobby, and I remember that conversation with him. And I remember the the first thing for him was what I realized is men have taken themselves out of the conversation. Because we forced them out. You don't have a womb. You don't have a say. Yeah, forget that you're you know, 50% of the creation of the baby. <laughs> and that's my <laughs> thing. Like, they don't even have a say. Like, if, if they want the baby and a woman doesn't, they don't even have a say about whether or not they can keep their own child. So, yeah. kick men out of the room. And then we want to invite them back in and say, say something so we can kick them out of the room again. So, again. Bobby is Come trying on. to stay yeah. out of the room. And I'm letting him know, Bobby, you have to step in the room. It's Come a woman's on. choice. I can't. I say, yeah, it's a woman's body. I can't. I say, it's her body. I said, Bobby, do, do you and your mom have the same body? And that just gets them every time. And I think that another thing that happened during the campaign was Bobby lost his nephew. Bobby and Cheryl lost their nephew. And I think that he had, um, I think he was physically disabled and had some challenges. And I just remember telling them that he was so happy and full of life that this is why we're pro-life because every life has value. Right. And this is yes. why I yes. fight pro-life. And then once I was able to work with them and started submitting policy and information on how it was a black genocide and how they were killing my people, they were like, oh, wait a minute, hold on, something's got to give. So God was working the whole time. And I had already prayed for a unity ticket, right? Because mm-hmm. you can ask anybody, when it comes to RFK and Trump, those are my two favorite white men in this whole wide world, okay? <laughs> I do not play about RFK and Trump. But I had already said a long time ago we needed a unity ticket because we needed to bring our we needed to bring our country together. We needed to stop Sorry. fighting. Like even yes. fighting, Come on. fighting each other. We're no longer sitting at the dinner table. 
We yeah. don't want to fight. We want to bring all of these ideas, everything together, and we want to find solutions. So we want to win again. And I yeah. think you know we've 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 lost so much of this country. Uh, we've lost the patriotism. We've lost our history. You know, even the bad history. Let's not lose it so that we don't uh, repeat it. Let's to, let's let's embrace the actual history of the United States again. And to me, I mean, I recently teamed up with a guy that I ran against in 2022 for my um, in my run for Congress. And when people came after me, why are you doing that? Why are you doing it? I'm like, because I'm tired of losing. We have to be able to work together. We have to be able to sit down at a table and go, do we agree on 80%? Okay, then we agree. Do we agree on 85%, 90% of the time? We agree. But yeah. yet uh, we allow these, these, these issues. And a lot of people are frustrated with Trump right now in the pro-life movement because they feel like he's a squishy pro-lifer. And he is. But I keep telling people he's trying to appeal to the moderates. And I would rather... I would rather save uh, one baby than no babies. I would rather save a hundred babies than no babies. Kamala Harris would murder babies until the moment they're born and not even think twice about it. There isn't uh, another choice. It's and, astonishing and, and to me. That, and I've been faced with that a lot. And what I say all the time to that is we really don't have a, a pro-life candidate right now. We don't. Right? No, we just, not. We, we don't have a pro-life candidate in the way that you and I would want one. Uh, right. We don't have a pro-life candidate who understands why we're pro-life, right? To them, it's a political issue. But these are not political issues to Heidi St. John and to Angela Stanton. These are moral issues. These are issues of right and wrong, of good versus evil. But unfortunately, the culture is not there right now because these voices have not been elevated. And with Trump in the White House, you have a chance. And with RFK working with them, you have a chance to make your case. And without uh, voices like that, you don't even have an opportunity to make your case for and life, you, right? You're right, because there are no voices like mine on the Democrat side. That's you're, right. You're, you're anti-woman. You're anti if you speak about saving black life, if you speak about valuing black life, if you speak about us not being willing participants to lynch our own children in the womb. The hypocrisy is stunning. It's just stunning. It uh, the it, it is like Black Lives Matter is such a joke. And I mean, I saw this very early on. I was like, you you guys, the people that are promoting Black Lives Matter want you to murder the unborn black baby. So mm -hmm. don't tell me that they care about black lives. What a joke yeah. from the very beginning. Then, of course, we discovered Patrice Cullors, just a, you know, just a con artist. You know, so many of these people that have been platformed. And I am, am, ra am praying God raise up a generation of warriors yes. who can have the wisdom and discernment to be able to walk into a room yes. and make a case for life. And we can't yes. do that if we just stay in the echo chamber. You got to get out of the echo chamber. So true. And I'm just so excited, Heidi, to be on your show today. Uh, girl, I'm, I'm excited. We've well, you and I have a friend. <laughs> we have a, a common, a friend in common in uh, Dr. Simone Gold. She was on my show several times in the middle of the... Her. I love her too. In the middle of the pandemic, these voices that are so brave and have really taken a hit. I mean, Simone took a hit. See, and oh, uh, listen, I talk about that in the book. Everybody, you've got to go get your copy. So I'm tell us, a, uh, tell us about the book, and I'm going to link to it in the show notes today. But yeah. uh, tell us a little bit about your book, and because it just came out, I'm super, so, I'm super excited. It just came out. You're actually the first show that I've done since it Come dropped. On. In the Come LA. on, I'm, I'm feeling kind of good about that. Listen, I'm going to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe against Jesse Lee Peterson next week, so hold me down. But listen, check this Girl. out. King Trump Kennedy, it's a memoir, rescued by King, pardoned by Trump, and positioned by Kennedy. It's available on Amazon right now. You can get it in paperback, ebook, and then you can also get it in Audible. Just ride around in your car, listen to it. It is an awesome, awesome story. Did you read it for Audible? I had, I, no, it's not in my book. Okay. I didn't have okay. time to do that. But I also yeah. have blurbs on the book. We've got one from Alveda King. I've got one from RFK. We've got one from Trump. Guys, listen, the foreword was written by my favorite uncle, Uncle Roger Stone, guys. Uh, <laughs> this story is just so freaking amazing. You have to read this book. We talk about what happened with January 6th. I talk about the Tulsa rally, uh, flying in on the plane with Herman Cain. We know God bless his soul. He passed away too long. Not after that. Like there is some really, really, really good stuff in this book. And we break down the genocide 
of mm. abortion in this book as well. So shout out to King, Trump, and Kennedy. Thank you guys for blessing me, my mama King, RFK, and Trump. I love you all. This is the real story of unity. You'd be surprised what God can do. <laughs> mm. Well, I, I am continuing to be Angie is super fan of you and of what God's doing in your life. And uh, I told you, I can't wait to get you out here uh, because I think the next frontier, I mean, we, we you save uh, the black babies by making sure we don't extinguish them in the womb. And then we have got to reform and uh, work on and bring salvation again to education in this country, because that's what's killing those of us who, the, you know, the, the, the children that survive the genocide in the womb, both black and white, then they're targeted in the schools by drag queens and all kinds oh, of God. wicked ideology. Oh, so oh, if they God. can't if they can't extinguish them in the womb, then they then they injure them, body, soul, mind and spirit through the education. They want to sterilize them. Anything. hundred percent. Create us from from reproducing. That's right. hundred percent. And life, you and I. Yeah, we both see it. Where can people find you if they want to find you online, my friend? Oh, guys, I'm probably one of your most censored influencers. OK, so if you got we hop around a lot. You can always go to Angela Stanton King dot com to keep up with where I'm at on X. It seems to be a safe space for me right now. I'm the Auntie Angie on X. Whoop, whoop. So you guys can go follow me on X. <laughs> on IG, I'm the Angie Stan. And I keep up a lot of fuss. So don't follow me unless you have tough skin, okay? <laughs> <laughs> That's why I love you, girl. Uh, Angie Stanton, you are a national hero, and I Thank love, you. uh, you're just a treasure for the Lord. I love what God is doing through your story. It's a redemption story. And uh, you are a modern day Joseph. And I'm so, I can't wait to see where God takes you next. So, uh, yes. so keep me on your short list. I will. I want you to go get that audible version, Heidi. I want you to read that book and call me back and give me a review. And I want to Girl. add you to my reviews online. All right. Thank I you. will. I will do it. Hey, you guys, for those of you who want more information about my guest today, you know how to do it. Hop on over the show notes. I will link back to her new book in the show notes today, and I hope that it encourages you. You guys, there's so much work to be done in the pro-life movement, and this is the moment that we can work together to uh, to bring more voices to the table and start talking to each other. I hope you've been encouraged by this interview, and I will see you right back here again at the intersection of faith and